So my name is Joel Alicki. I'm going to talk um, both about what I did over the summer at Arcos and um, starting an open source business and other things. So um, to get started, I'll talk about open source hardware in general and then the actual Arcos project I did over the summer. And then some of the various business models that can be used for open source hardware. It's a bit different than anything else, so it's probably worth covering. And then um, the business, and then more of the uh, actual project I know from the summer. And then something else. So um, hopefully you all know what open source software is by now. Uh, open source hardware is pretty similar and supports the same ideals, but there are some um, defining characteristics that are a bit different. So um, the open source hardware definition 1.0 lists 12 key attributes that a hardware project must have to be considered open source. And this is according to the Open Source Hardware Association, which is currently the only sort of formal definition that exists. So um, there has to be documentation. So the hardware must re be released with documentation including the raw design files, and it must allow modification and distribution of design files. So this means that giving out the um, PCB layout as a PDF or an image isn't enough. You actually need the raw files that can be used to edit that. Um, the scope, so it must clearly define what parts of the project are in the open source license. This allows for components of a project to be reused in a different project. Um, if the software, if the design requires software embedded or otherwise, um, the interfaces must be well documented so that you could produce an open source version if you wanted to or the software has to be released under an OSI license. Modifications and derived works must be allowed under the same license, and it also has to allow manufacture, sale, distribution, and use of any products created from the design. It has to be um, free redistribution, so you can give away the product documentation or any derived works from that without having to pay a royalty fee to the original designer. Um, you can require attribution, it's not, you don't have to, but you are allowed to require attribution to yourself in the license. But you can't specify, specify the format of display, so you are allowed to take an open source hardware project and re redistribute the source in a different form as long as you retain the attribution, whether or not you're changing it from a text file to a PDF or something. That box goes away, you'll be able to read that. But there's um, no discrimination against people or groups. It's pretty self explanatory. <laughs> um, no discrimination against fields of endeavor, so you can use it um, education, military, commercially. Um, so you can't restrict how it would end up being used in that use. Um, the license must still apply when the work is redistributed without any additional licenses. Um, the license must be specific to a product, um, so it has to, it must not be specific to a product, so it could apply to a component, a component of a product and you could reuse that component in a different application. So it allows for you to take like a single part of something and reuse it and keep the same license. So you can't say you're only allowed to use this interface or this style of control if you're making product XYZ. You're allowed to adapt it to any. Um, the license um, can't restrict other hardware or software, so it has to, must be allowed to be distributed with closed source components or software. This is important for hardware because a lot of hardware is closed source. Although you're using components, you're going to be using them as a black box component where you may or may not actually have the source code for what's inside a chip or what's inside a smaller subpart. And it must be technology neutral, so it can't require a particular technology part, component, material, or style of interface. And this is a very different from open source software licenses, it's more controls on patent law rather than copyright law. It's common for open source hardware to use adapted OSI licenses, such as the GPL, LGPL, or BSD license. Um, open Cores, which is the largest open source hardware community at the moment, um, uses LGPL with some minor modifications. So now I'll talk about my project from over the summer, which was called Embedded Hardware with, um, yeah, embedded hardware with MSP430. This was my official Arcos project over the summer.
So the TI MSP430 Launchpad is a low-cost microcontroller development board. It's very similar to the Arduino, and it can be used in many simple robotics or embedded projects, especially in an academic setting. And the goal of the project was to develop a lab manual, a sort of textbook focusing on project-based tutorials. We didn't get much of the actual text done over the summer, however, we did write a lot of code and developed several open source hardware mini projects. And these are going to be used in the tutorials. And this semester, the work's going to continue with the emphasis on documenting all the stuff that was done over the summer. So now open source so hardware business models are a bit different than open source software business models. From Research, these are the major models that exist. You can produce, you can um, conduct services, so you can do design work, consulting work for an open source hardware product. You can actually manufacture the open hardware. You can manufacture proprietary hardware with open source hardware components. You can dual license hardware and have a proprietary license for use in closed source applications. This is not as common, but it has been seen with some Arduino-based things where Arduino-like components were being used in commercial products in a closed source form, while an open source version was also released simultaneously. Um, you can release proprietary tools designed for open source hardware development. Um, you can form partnerships between manufacturing and distribution. Um, a good example of this is Pinoco, who does laser cutting and fabrication and spark fun electronics. Um, to allow lower cost manufacturing of custom projects. And you can also fund an open source project for complete documentation. Um, Arduino, in particular, has two major business models where they share open hardware to sell their expertise, knowledge, and custom services and projects around it. So they're getting most of their money from consulting type projects. And they also sell the hardware but by trying to keep ahead of it, um, competition, releasing better products frequently. Uh, although anyone can copy their product, and certainly people do, all they'll be doing is advertising Arduino's products. Arduino will still be the major name that you look for when you look for an Arduino, you don't look for an Arduino um, So over the summer, I founded Lib3 Incorporated. Uh, Lib3 is an online retail business focusing on open source hardware. Um, profit will come from discounts and volume manufacturing not normally available to individuals. However, all products will have documentation sufficient to reproduce them and include a list of component sources. This means that someone who already has a bench full of components may not have to buy the whole kit. They may be able to just buy the PCB and populate it themselves. And uh, this is the, a sub-project that was developed over the summer with Arcos. Um, it's the Programmable Intelligent LED, or PILED board, and it features three high-current LED drivers, three linear slide potentiometers, a microphone, a hardware envelope filter for the microphone, two push buttons, various forms of serial communication, and Bluetooth. 3.3 um, and 5-volt regulators so that you can attach custom sensors and devices to it. Um, a bunch of extra I.O. so you can easily add interfaces. And it's going to be available as a do-it-yourself kit with um, all the components necessary and a pre-programmed MSP430. And I have a demo of this. Yeah. It's connected over Bluetooth right now. I tried to write a processing script this morning to have a nice GUI for it, but that ended up not happening. So right now it's still um, a serial shell. Is that readable? Yeah. So it supports two major commands, set RGB, which instantaneously puts it to a color. So if I wanted it to light up um, purple, fairly bright purple, I could do um, set RGB 255, 0, and 255, which means that the red component will be full brightness, the um, green component will be off, and the blue component will be full brightness. And it also can do target RGB, which is um, over a uh, like specified time interval. So if I were to have it fade to green, that'll slowly fade over 10 seconds into green. Um, the ser Bluetooth serial interface is useful to allow simple scripting um, in virtually any language on the computer to control it. 
as soon as that gets to green, I'll go back to the presentation. It's 100 seconds, they're all not 10 seconds. Yeah, I, I might have had an extra zero there. <laughs> it's in milliseconds, I yeah, have an extra zero. <laughs> And it's designed for use as an um, LED fixture, so sort of like a desk lamp, night light, that kind of thing. Although it's going to come with LED tape that you can, you don't have to attach in a panel. You could run it around the edge of a desk inside a computer. I think along those lines. Have you thought about making a smartphone application to control it? Um, I can control it with my smartphone already. Being that it's Bluetooth serial, you can talk to it from virtually any platform with a terminal program. It has a self-contained shell. Anything you see on the screen here is actually coming from the launch pad, not from the device. So you should be able to talk to it from any smartphone or tablet. I don't know about an iPod. I imagine if they can do Bluetooth, you probably could. That's a picture of the um, board, which is over there on the table, so you probably can't see it very well. So um, it says, what about that Kickstarter on top? People who were over the, here over the summer saw this slide probably four or five times. Um, everything's ready except for the things that aren't again. Uh, right now, all that's pending is Kickstarter approval. However, I've been waiting off on that for a very specific reason. I have some cards with a link to the um, website. If anyone's interested, I can get some at the end. So everyone should go to World Maker Fair, September 29th and 30th in New York City. It's essentially a show and tell, trade show, fair, of open source hardware and things. Um, has lots of cool open source projects by individuals as well as commercial projects and displays. Um, there's going to be over 500 exhibits of projects such as 3D printers, Arduino things, and Architect, which is a band that makes music with large Tesla coils. Uh, student admission is only $16.50, and I'm going to have a booth there. So it's going to be hands-on demonstrations exploring color space, PWM, and audio-driven lighting effects using the pile boards. So uh, thanks to Sean O'Sullivan, Morthy, and everyone here. Each other, but you can connect multiple ones to a computer. Okay. If you had noticed, I was actually on COM17. I've been testing it with more than one at my apartment. I only brought one for sake of not annoying you guys too much with bright LEDs. But yeah, you can connect, I think, up to 255 directly to one computer. Uh, if you wanted multiple ones, you can connect them to each other using I2C, and they can communicate between each other that way. What was the uh, total cost of all the hardware? Um, for the prototypes? For the prototypes, yeah. Um, not actually that much. I think it came out to around $35 per complete setup. That's not bad. Including the overpriced prototype PCBs. So. Uh, is the company you made something that you're going to be doing after school, or is it just for fun? Um, well, hopefully it's not just for fun, but I mean, I guess I'll find out. Ideally, it's going to grow to be a large company. Can I ask why you're holding off on Kickstarter? I was holding off on, right, I nearly explained that. Since I'm going to be at Maker Faire, I want the Kickstarter campaign to coincide with that. So I want at least a week of time after Maker Faire for people to be able to go and find the Kickstarter for a campaign. So the Kickstarter campaign usually runs for a month. So it'll be being launched pretty soon, at least two weeks before Maker Faire. So it's going to be some lineup basically in the middle.